Hello and welcome back to another lecture on um, international taxation. And today's topic will be the treatment of dividends in the double taxation treaties and a bit on the economic background or the um, underlying constraints. Yeah, well, let's first begin with a qualification uh, clarification concerning the terminology because sometimes I notice that beginners still um, mix up what's a dividend and what is something else. So the clarification should be um, yeah, brought forward that dividends naturally can only exist if we have a company which distributes profits to shareholders. So a juridical person, AG, GmbH, limited company, stock corporation or so, something like that can pay dividends whereas partnerships or even a sole tradership can just by definition never pay out a dividend so if a natural person takes out money from his or her um, sole tradership or partnership this will just be called a withdrawal of money from the firm or partnership and such withdrawals are usually no income at all because the sole trader or partner has already taxed the money, he is already the owner of the money and so this is no income. Whereas in case of a dividend, the money first belongs to your company, later after the dividend payment the money belongs to you, so indeed a dividend payment makes the shareholder richer, the withdrawal does not. So Article 10 on dividends can only apply to profits which are paid by a juridical person. So by companies like a limited, a PLC, GmbH, AG, SE, Société Anonyme, Société à Responsabilité, Limité, so the French versions, Société par Azioni, or whatever you have in your country as juridical persons, uh, as forms of companies. Um, it might be that under tax law in the one or other country a partnership might be treated or seen as if it were a corporation then consequently you can also see a payment of profits to the owner as a dividend but only if the entity is seen as a company by tax law only then dividends are possible. Well, how can then in principle dividends be taxed in a cross-border context? And um, yeah, let's have a look. Imagine we have company A here and naturally then we have a shareholder in state B. The dividend goes from state A to state B and now let's say it's 100,000 euro. Then we can have first in the country where the dividend comes from, it will be seen as inland income so they can apply their limited tax liability rules or whatever they call what they have instead so they tax the dividend in the country of source uh, by the way the country of source of a dividend is by general consent always assumed to be the um, residence country of that company let's say in that um, company state or source state the tax taken is 25,000 euro. Then in a second step we have also the taxation in the country of the shareholder uh, because where the shareholder lives there will probably be a tax on the worldwide income. Now the dividend is a part of the worldwide income so they charge the shareholder also with income tax. Let's say that might be between 15,000 or 45,000 or what else. So we end up with a double taxation. So we will have to do something against that. Now, how can that double taxation be avoided here in principle? And the logical possibilities are, well, one of the two states uh, involved will have to cut back his, or better, its claim on the tax, um, either fully or partly. And the logical possibilities are well, only the source state taxes a dividend, 
or only the country of residence tax as a dividend or both tax a dividend but both cut down their uh, claims a bit so that in total a tolerable total burden remains let's analyze the different situations let's begin with the first logical possibility let's say we write a double taxation treaty now from from scratch from zero and we say we give the right to tax dividends exclusively to the country of the company what would be the consequences imagine we have state a uh, with dividends 25 percent state b taxes only dividends with 10 percent and now you would say where would an investor like to invest the naive answer would be all investments would go to state B because state B has a lower tax. Um, this answer is naive on the first glance at least because it um, works only under the assumption that the invested capital, if you invest in state A or in state B, brings the same yield, so the same profit. Um, this is in reality, in most cases, not true. So let's have a look when you have an example that you can invest 1 million either in state A or in state B as a shareholder. Then it might be that the gross profit, which will be sufficient to pay out a dividend of 133,333 can be produced with that 1 million in state A. Whereas state B can only pay out a dividend of 100,000 in that case. Um, having to pay 25% tax on the dividend in state A would leave you with 100,000 net dividend in state B, where you get 100,000, um, and then have to pay only 10% would leave you with 90,000 only. In that case, it would be absolutely clear that even although there is a higher tax rate, you would still invest your money preferably in state A. That was why that first conclusion was probably naive. However, life is full with surprises. In that case, there are constellations where the naive view just accidentally hits the truth. Let's have a look on that. Because in real life, you often have groups of enterprises. Uh, and now, whereas it is clear that if you are a shareholder in a French company or a shareholder in a German company, um, it makes a difference if you invest your money in France or in Germany. No? But now imagine there is a group which has a subsidiary in France and a subsidiary in Germany. And naturally, that group is governed by a holding company on top. And that holding company on top can now either be placed in state A, Germany, or state B, France. And here we see you get your dividend now from the holding, so it's officially then sourced either in state A or state B. Now imagine we have that constellation. The group has um, subsidiaries in state A and state B. And we have the, these different tax rates. Um, now, if you get your dividend later officially from a holding located in state A, uh, there would be a tax due of 25%. However, if we now change the situation a bit and place the holding company in state B, then our shareholder gets now a dividend from state B and the source state tax that was assumed by us in state B is only 10%. So in that case, he gets exactly the same money from the same investments. And the final tax burden just depends on where the holding company was placed. That's an arbitrary result, and that would invite people to tax saving models. Probably um, the whole holding structures of the world would be reorganized. Or we would have a strong pressure for all states to... Um, just lower the withholding taxes, the source state taxes on top level um, institutions. So that can't be our final solution. So we can set up that dividends 
uh, to tax dividends in the country where they come from is not a good idea. So uh, the idea we tax in this host country and then we grant exemption in the um, country of the recipient, of the taxpayer who gets the money, that's not a good idea, at least not for portfolio investments. So forget about this. Keep in mind the standard approach, taxation in the source country plus exemption in the country of residence, which is so well liked by many countries, that um, standard approach can't work here. Now, a second alternative. What if the taxes go to the country where the recipient, so the shareholder lives? In that case, uh, you will find out it plays no role where the holding of a group is located because the shareholder always pays the tax level of his home state. So the tax is always as high as at home. Tricks, as described, are not possible, have no influence on the tax burden. So that would be a good solution for dividends. Let's make it kind of intermediate summary of, all, of our findings. First conclusion would be for dividends, it's a very adequate solution to give the right to tax to the country of residence of the taxpayer. So there should be no exemption method for dividends, even in case where a state usually favors the exemption method and hates the credit method. Here the exemption method would be bad. Here we would have to turn to the credit method if at all. So for dividends, indeed, that's the solution. So you find in the um, Article 23a of the Model Convention, the clarification or strictly underlined that exemption applies to nearly everything when exemption method is granted, but not to dividends. Income regulated under Article 10 as dividends. And for that, the exemption method is clearly excluded. In the formulation of the dividend article, that is even underlined again, because before the dividend article talks about what might be taxed by the source state, it begins with a clarification that under all circumstances, the state of residence has a right to tax the dividend. Um, okay. Now that alternative two, well, here to talk about the credit method, was logically a bit inconsistent still, because if you give the right to tax the dividend only to the country of residence, there would be no need to credit some tax from the source country. But what now if for fiscal reasons the source state says we also want a bit of the prey, we want also to levy a tax on the dividend. In that case, naturally, the country of residence should be obliged to grant the credit method to avoid double taxation. And we should design the rules then in a way that this, what in the end counts, um, so that, that the total tax burden is in the end still the tax burden of the country of residence so that the dividend taxation keeps its neutrality for placing for the decision where I place my holding company and things like that. No? So we should additionally limit the tax which can be levied by the source country because two reasons, only that way um, makes it sure that also the country of residence get a bit, uh, gets a bit of money and also it would probably lead to distorting effects if in the end the source country taxation is higher than the resident country taxation because then the source country tax level would be decisive for the decisions of the taxpayer and the structuring of groups and things like that. Well, so that is why when we look to Article 10 we see some limits there. Um, that the source country can tax the dividends, but only up to a certain upper limit. Um, now, when you have a closer look on that, you will find that Article 10, Paragraph 2 of the Double Taxation Treaty Model Convention 
says usually it's okay, um, 15%. In certain constellations, only 5%. So the next question which we have to ask ourselves is why is the upper limit for the tax and the source state fixed differently depending on if the shareholder is just the usual kind of shareholder, so a natural person or a company with a small participation, or if it is a parent company which holds a major participation. You know? um, the answer is, well, that follows a bit, or that can be understood if you have a look to the overall effects in the two different situations. Let's have first a look on the average shareholder situation. Let's say here you have the shareholder in state B, you have the company in state A, the dividend flows cross border, shareholder gets 100,000. State A says, I tax the dividends with the allowed 15%, so with 15% here. Uh, state B says, I claim naturally my own tax, 25%. Then I apply the credit method, so my tax claim is reduced by what you already paid abroad by 15,000. The remaining payment to the state of residence is 10,000. That means the total tax burden is uh, 15,000 in the state of source, 10,000 in the state of residence. Here the credit method leads to a total amount of 25. That's exactly the total tax burden in the state of residence. So. The source country levies a tax, but it is neutral for decisions. You have no impact on the overall um, burden of the taxpayer. He has to pay 25 for investments at home and 25 for investments in the other country. Everything's fine and everything's nice. So we have especially no influence on the structure of groups or so at least no easily understandable ones. Well, I never should say never in a field like taxation. Well, now that changes if the tax rate in the country of source would get higher than the shareholder's personal income tax rate. You still know that effect of the credit method probably. So company in state A, shareholder in state B, we have the dividend. Now imagine company in state A takes a withholding tax of enormous 35%. The tax in the resident state is 25. You would have a credit. You would have a remaining tax burden of zero in the resident state. The total tax burden would now be determined by the source state taxation. And in this case, we would now have an influence of the source state tax level that has an influence on decisions, distortions could arise. And that explains why we need to fix a limit here. Well, however, 15% was evidently not problematic. And uh, naturally the question is why. Um, the OECD model convention says 15% is our recommendation. And you find this in 10.2 letter B, and the underlying idea is most probably you will find no investor who gets cross-border dividend income and pays a lesser, a lower tax than 15% on income at home. Yeah? At least these care cases will be extremely rare, and that is why they say, yeah, 15%, that's an agreeable upper limit until or up to that, the source state can levy a tax. Now, why is the situation different when you have a parent company which holds a major participation? Um, the underlying reason is, well, if you look to our law in the inland, you see that for dividends from a subsidiary, you get a dividend exemption if you are the holding company. Um, and the 8B KSDG, the dividend which goes to a parent, is tax free at the level of the parent. The underlying rule is, or the underlying reason is, well, the subsidiary already paid full corporation tax and we don't want to take corporation tax twice. So the situation here for cross border payment would be company in state A pays to company in state B. We have 1 million. 
Now imagine the withholding tax were 15% like in all other cases. Then the regular tax in the resident state would be zero under AP. The credit would be granted but has no effect because the um, final tax remains zero and it was already zero, so we saved nothing. And the total tax burden would nevertheless be 150. 50,000, sorry, here's the typing mistake, 150,000. And that means now the taxation in the source state becomes decisive for decisions. That is now that what counts, and that is what we didn't want, first thing. And even more important, our main aim was to reduce double taxations of cross-border income flows. And now, when you look here, um, for a dividend between a subsidiary and a parent in an internal situation, so in the same state, there was no tax at all. Now, in the cross-border relation, you have one tax which remains and is definitive. So, you have now an extra burden for the cross-border relationship, which doesn't exist at home. So, we still have a kind of a double taxation, an additional tax burden for the cross-border investment, which does not exist in the non-cross-border, in the merely internal context. So here we have missed our aim, our basic aim of a double taxation treaty. We did not fully avoid double taxation. We did not avoid extra burdens on cross-border activity. So we should at least mitigate the effect and limit it to a minimum. And that is why the OECD then says, um, for such a constellation where the parent company usually in the internal surrounding has some dividend exemption or an equivalent relief, there the OECD says, we should first see a major participation everywhere where you have at least 25% in the other company. The background is that at least from 25% onwards, nearly all states worldwide know something like 8B, KSDG, or an equivalent relief to avoid a double taxation with corporation tax within a group. So most states say if you have a group of enterprises, then the underlying profit should not tax several times with corporation tax. We should take care that within a group only once the full corporation tax is paid. And most people, most states do this from 25% onwards or even from a lower participation onwards. But as there is nearly a general consent that from 25% onwards you must do something for the groups, the OECD said, okay, we should propose that from 25% onwards everybody should have a special regime for parent and subsidiary relations. And they proposed to set an upper limit of only 5% for those holding tax. So they, uh, they only mitigate this effect. They do not reduce it completely or eliminate it completely. In real life, the states involved often negotiate uh, slightly different solutions here. For example, very often they agree on a lower threshold for a major participation, especially in if in both their national pool systems, uh, they grant something like 8B already at a lower level than 25%. So Germany often tries to negotiate that we write here the threshold for a major participation as 10%, because in our internal law it's 10%. And so we try to convince the other contracting party to agree to 10% too. And sometimes they even try to agree on a lower percentage for the source state, lower than 5%. Sometimes even 0% is discussed and in very rare cases even established for these cases. Well, what does that mean now? Um, we might now have double taxation treaties with different 
upper limits for major participations. So if a state has DTTs with different upper limits, let's say we have, imagine we have one, um, if a dividend is paid out to France, then the upper limit for the withholding tax uh, for a payment to a French parent company is zero. If um, it goes to South Africa, let's say, then it's 5%. In that case, um, these different upper limits generate a strong incentive to organize the whole structure of a group with regard to minimizing the withholding tax burdens on intra-group dividend payments. Now that sounds abstract, what is really meant? You have company A in state A. You have an intermediate holding which you place in state B. You have the ultimate parent company in state C. Now dividend is first paid to state B with 1% under the relevant DTT. And the dividend goes from state B to state C. And let's say the DTT there also just demands 2%. That might be cheaper than the direct relationship company A, state A, company C, 5% on the dividend. In that case, naturally, I would think about restructuring or redesigning the whole group. And now you would say ah, for 2% tax saving effect, would that be worth the efforts and the answer as well. If these intra-group dividends are 100 million per year, then 2% of 100 million per year is a tax saving of 2 million. Yes, that is worth the effort, naturally. And um, this phenomenon that sometimes you try to make usage of more attractive treaty conditions than the legislator had in mind for the direct way of a dividend. This um, behavior is called treaty shopping. Um, that means you set up a company in a foreign state um, in order to get entitled to use the conditions of that treaty. It's not surprising that these maneuvers are seen by the fiscal authorities as abusive. Um, nowadays, even after the reforms um, which have been established under the multilateral instrument, this treaty which overrides all existing double taxation treaties, nearly all the DTTs are designed or are meant to get a clause which is a principal purpose test or something like that. So if there is a juridical person in a contracting state for whose existence there is no convincing um, economic reason, but the suspicion it was only used for tax purposes, then the benefits of the treaty are completely denied. That's a reaction to that. Um, so states very often find these tricks, which we have here, not nice, because you avoid 5% dividend payment replace it by 1% uh, plus 2% to another state who was not really involved. That's not nice. And so what they do is they try to design anti-abuse rules where they say, if you structure your group in a certain way, which is under the tax aspect positive, but is suspected to be only for taxation, um, then we deny the reduction to five percent uh, to one percent in that case and only give you a basic reduction to which you would have been entitled under different circumstances. Um, these anti-abuse rules usually end up in a very complicated way because it's very very difficult to decide under which circumstances you can safely assume that the whole structure of a group is only or mainly motivated by tax saving ideas and is not motivated by genuine business ideas. The EU has um, reacted to the problem in a relatively intelligent way because they try to get rid of the problem um, in a thorough way. So they issued a so-called parent subsidiary directive in 1990 
which regulated the dividend payment cross-border within a group of companies. So for the case where the parent and the subsidiary are both companies established under EU law in different EU states and where so a dividend is paid cross-border within the group. So exactly our um, uh, problem. Here they said that um, first there must be a kind of 8B or similar privilege or better relief on the level of the parent company so that corporation tax is not taken twice. So as everybody, would, nearly every legislator would automatically do it. And secondly, that the state of source where the dividend comes from, the state of the subsidiary, is not allowed to keep any withholding tax at all. So the upper limit within the EU is 0% instead of the OECD recommended 5%. Um, and the threshold for a major participation is there even fixed at 10% instead of 25%. Um, surprisingly, the EU states still, when they negotiate new double taxation treaties, very often follow the OECD model recommendation and copy that one by one instead of replacing the 5% by 0% and the 25% threshold by 10%. Um, their justification or the reason seems to be that the EU directive does not officially apply to all existing legal forms, uh, but only to certain, to all the most relevant company constructions, so that there might be still some yeah, rare constellations where the full withholding tax of 5% might be collected. And evidently for these rare cases, one still upholds these, this upper limit of 5%. And the treaty texts, yeah. so that the treaty then says you can take up to 5% and EU law says no, you are forbidden to make usage of that right, you end up with 0%. Okay, that shall be sufficient as a small overview about how dividends are taxed in the OECD model, especially keep in mind its Article 10 and its taxation right for both countries involved. The state of residence here has always a right to tax, so even exemption states do not renounce on their right to tax. And the tax of the source state is limited, uh, either 15% in the general case, assumption 15% credit for a regular income, a corporation taxpayer makes no negative impact, you can always get that fully credited. Whereas for the parent companies, they are in a special situation, so they need, they have a special problem and there we must mitigate the otherwise horrendous effect who is holding tax by lowering the upper limit to, as the OECD says, 5%, and as other progressive states sometimes try to say at a lower level. Okay, enough for today. Thank you, and see you again soon. If you are further interested in the channel, don't forget to like the channel, recommend the channel to others, and yeah, welcome back. So, thanks.